Hello and welcome. I'm Karen Rapp and on behalf of the Department of Art and Art History and the LeBand Art Gallery, I welcome you to Kaleido LA. I'm hosting this artist lecture series from the Loyola Marymount University campus in Los Angeles. And I want to acknowledge this land as the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. I'm grateful to everyone who has helped me make this web-based series a success. Thank you to the faculty and staff of the Art and Art History Department, especially Arturo Mejia, Sari Cho Dobson, Alegria Garcia. There are also two students, Emma Pollan and Jose Camacho, who are integral members of this team, as well as Molly Corey, the LeBand's gallery manager. It has been my privilege to plan and realize this artist lecture series around themes of social, economic, and racial justice, and to center artists who identify as BIPOC, an acronym for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. I hope that by sharing their stories with us, and in particular with our students, these artists will inspire our ongoing efforts toward creating and maintaining diversity, equity, and inclusion in the arts at LMU. A note about housekeeping. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can write questions or give your reactions throughout the talk. Once our guest today finishes her presentation, your questions will be read aloud and will be answered live. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be archived on YouTube with a link available on the Kaleido LA website. Today, I am proud to welcome Dr. Tiffany Barber to Kaleido LA. Dr. Barber is a scholar, curator, and critic of 20th and 21st century visual art, new media, and performance. Her work focuses on artists of the Black diaspora working in the United States and the broader Atlantic world. She writes about abstraction, Afrofuturism, dance, fashion, feminism, and the ethics of representation and aesthetic criticism. She is currently assistant professor of Africana studies and art history at the University of Delaware. From 2016 to 2018, she was a pre-doctoral fellow at the Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies at the University of Virginia. She earned a graduate certificate in African and African American Studies in the Frederick Douglass Institute for African and African American Studies at the University of Rochester, and a graduate certificate in Gender and Women's Studies in the Susan B. Anthony Institute at the University of Rochester. In addition to sharing with us today one of her exciting research subjects, the Kenyan American artist Wangeshi Mutu, Dr. Barber will also talk about her own personal journey. She is originally from Oklahoma. As an undergraduate, she majored in dance at Fordham University, the Alvin Ailey School in New York. Her education at Fordham, a Jesuit university, has impacted her educational philosophy. She came to California to obtain her master's degree which she completed in 2008 at the University of Southern California in a program called Public Art Studies. After holding several arts administration positions in Los Angeles, she embarked on a PhD in visual and cultural studies in the Department of Art and Art History 
at the University of Rochester, which she completed in 2017. She's going to talk today about her journey in the context of having a career that crosses disciplines in the arts. She will also address her work in the field of art history, a field that is actually in the process of reflection and reckoning to decolonize its curriculum. Today, Dr. Tiffany Barber joins us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where she currently lives. I am thrilled to have her as our art historian in the Kaleido series for fall 2020. Um, Tiffany, if I may ask you to please join me at the virtual podium. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to turn over the, um, the camera that I realized maybe I didn't even um, turn on for myself this, this afternoon uh, to you. And thank you so much for, um, for joining us and sharing um, your time with us today, Dr. Barber. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Karen. That was a wonderful um, introduction. Um, it's rare that, um, when I give talks that people go so in depth with my background, but I think it's important not only to this series, but also to my work, um, which I'm constantly reminding people that I have a practitioner background and that really informs the way that I look at art and media objects. Um, and it also informs my, my teaching pedagogy. So um, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, I actually have um, some history with Loyola Marymount that I will um, talk about a little bit later, but it's just nice to be back um, in good company. Um, and um, so thank you all for attending. Um, and again, to Karen for inviting me to share my work with you during this unprecedented epoch in human history. What a week. Um, and I'm, I'm just honored to be here to be able to share my work. Um, and Karen asked me, to discuss my, my journey, um, my scholarly and career trajectory to university professor, which as you already heard a little bit in her introduction, it's been a little circuitous and windy, a windy road. Um, but this week um, in particular, um, with all of the upheaval and the conversation about um, elections and, and citizenship and representation, um, uh, it's really brought up a couple of questions that are central to my work. Um, what is the role of art and artists during times of social and political upheaval during unrest? Um, why and how do we continue to persist in our creative labors, whatever those look like, um, in the midst of crisis and uncertainty? Um, and how can, how can or if or should, should our work um, be a part of the conversation about social change? Um, and these uh, questions are not unique um, to to us or this moment, these are actually questions that people have been grappling with at least since the early 20th century, um, but particularly for artists of African descent um, and questions about social responsibility um, and aesthetics. And so that's really um, where I wanted to start my talk. And the, they, these are questions that I pursue um, in my research, in my writing and in my curatorial work, which I'm gonna talk um, about for about 25 minutes. Um, and I also have images to show you, uh, as well as a clip of a video. Um, um, but the transitions between my, my presentation and um, uh, what you see on your screen might be a little clunky. So please bear with me. I am definitely not technologically savvy. Um, and then afterwards, I'll take questions that will likely um, spiral into me talking more about my work. Um, and I very much look forward to the conversation. Um, so as Karen intimated in her, her introduction, um, I've pursued and maintained many careers um, before becoming a university professor. I've moved from professional concert dance to arts administration and nonprofit management to freelance arts and grants writing to academia. Um, but the thread that ties all of those career paths together for me is my enduring interest and in creative expression, which first started at home. I'll share my screen with you now so you can see my home. <laughs> um, so on your screen, you see my, uh, my lovely mother. 
um, in her home studio. Um, as Karen mentioned, I grew up in Oklahoma City and my mother still lives there. Um, and her, her drawings and paintings of black female figures were my first encounters with um, black image making. This is her working on um, her latest painting, the first in a new series of black mermaids that she's making, which funny enough, um, Wangeshi Mutu, the artist that I'll talk a little bit more about later in my talk, um, also has, has done a series on mermaids um, and black mermaids and what the way, the role, the role that mermaids play in the, in the black diasporic imagination. So um, a fascinating thread <laughs> tying my mother to my current work. Um, and like most artists, my mom um, studied the masters. Um, she, but coming of age, but having come of age during the 1970s, during the black arts movement, she longed for figures and a canon that reflected her own experiences and identity. And as Karen talked about um, in her introduction, uh, as, as we reckon as art history, as a discipline and other, and the academy more broadly, other institutions in the US um, and globally reckon with our um, our kind of white settler and colonialist pasts and presence for that matter. Um, the Black Bar Arts Movement really is a kind of flashpoint for how, for, for questions about, um, quest questions and actions that called institutions to, to decolonize their imaginations um, in much of, in similar ways to what is being called for now. Um, the Black Arts Movement was the creative sibling to the Black Power Movement. Two, and both of those movements were motivated by a desire for safety and self-determination that emerged in the wake of the civil rights movement. Um, through activism and art, proponents of the Black arts movement created their own cultural institutions to promote Black power and pride. This ethos influenced my mother's drawings um, and paintings and much of her other art making, and she infused her work and her parenting with aspirational narratives about the right and wrong ways to picture and perform blackness. I myself don't draw or paint or sculpt. I dance and my training in classical ballet and modern continues to influence my curatorial and scholarly work on visual art, new media and performance. While pursuing my undergraduate degree at Fordham University, um, which had a joint program with the conservatory, the Ailey School, the premier center for black concert dance in New York City. I began to question aspirational representations of the black body. These formative moments sparked my love for the study of visual art and its histories. They taught me that lived experiences inform our encounters with art. They also taught me that looking closely at art objects and the sociocultural contexts from which they emerge can spur new ideas about the world, political possibility and contemporary social life. Wanting to explore intellectual work beyond the body led me to LA for my postgraduate studies in arts administration and curation, and curation in the mid 2000s. At this time, I worked full time in student affairs at Loyola Marymount. Um, I was a student leader in undergrad and Fordham like LMU is a Jesuit university. So through networking and reciprocity between the two institutions, um, I was able to land a full time job right out of college, which was really a blessing. Um, and I went to graduate school at the University of Southern California at night. So I had very long days, very early and long days. It was a, it was a very challenging time, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. It really taught me a lot. Um, this time in my life was incredibly fruitful and it really propelled me to where I am now. While finishing my master's degree, I transitioned from working in student affairs to working in the Metro Art Department where I helped manage the Transit Systems Public Art Program. At the time, I was also interning at LAX Art um, at its original location in Culver City. Um, and LAX Art um, remains a, a very um, vital hub for contemporary art um, experimentation within the Los Angeles um, art scene and the global contemporary art scene more broadly. And during this time, I also became involved with the Artist Driven um, Neighborhood Redevelopment Project in the South LA neighborhood of Watts, which was the start of my decade long professional relationship with LA based artist in Edgar Arsenault, who you see pictured um, in the lower right corner. That's he and I at a, a community event at Watts House Project. Through my work at Metro at LAX Art and Watts House Project, I learned about contemporary curatorial practice and fundraising and about art's relationship to the built environment. At all three, I worked with some of the most prominent contemporary artists and curators like Mark Radford, Corey Newkirk, Edgar, um, Pilar Tompkins, Naima Keith, 
And LAX Art's own programming is where I, I developed, initially developed my interest in contemporary art of the Black dias diaspora and really started to see that there was an intellectual project there. Artists of African descent are making some of the most compelling art of our time. Um, as I've, as if you're spending any time on social media, you know that. <laughs> and more people than ever before are engaged with their creative output. This is even more evident when it comes to Black women artists. Yet narrow ideas about art and representation, as well as racial and gender solidarity, continue to constrain Black women artists. How does the increased visibility of these cultural workers impact how we theorize art practice? In times of racial reckoning and turmoil, what do we expect Black women and their art to do? My book in progress, tentatively titled Undesirability and Her Sisters, Black Women's Visual Work, takes up these two inquiries to advance critical thinking on the significance of race, gender, and representation within our current era of social and political upheaval. Undesirability and Her Sisters contests well-worn assumptions about so-called women's work as a reparative or productive enterprise, um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. From womanist theology to public intellectual discourse, Black women's cultural production in the US has been synonymous with kinship, sisterhood, mothering, and reproduction. To redress the ruptures caused by slavery and its afterlives, metaphors of kinship have been used in Black ascetic discourse to imagine bonds and obligations between individuals of African descent and their communities. Kinship and sisterhood in this context typically refer to racial and gender affinity, common ancestry, or even togetherness as sources of redemption and the basis of a shared politics that somehow um, counteracts um, or has the power to counteract um, and repair um, instances of subjection and um, subjugation. The act of making kin, familial, and fictive has also been tied to kind and kindness for Black women, especially when that work takes the form of caring for children and nations, not their own. I'm thinking about the archetype of the, of the mammy figure um, and the welfare queen, um, these kinds of stereotypes um, that circulate within the media that get updated um, uh, pretty much every decade. Um, alternately, restoring fragments of identity and cultural history to wholeness animates much of the literature on Black aesthetics, while Black women have historically been constrained by protocols of behavior, reproductive value, and aesthetics in the public and private sphere. And here I usually, um, I like to point to um, Maxine Waters, another California figure, uh, Maxine Waters kind of um, infamous reclamation of her time um, uh, during the House uh, congressional meetings. <clears throat> Uh, I thought it was two years ago or so, but that kind of uh, repetition, reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time, and how that became, you know, be became a meme and it became a gif and all of these, you know, just attention to um, Black women's creative labors as a, as a site of um, contestation as well as resistance. Um, and so that tension is really something that I'm interested in in my work. And in the art world, these protocols materialize in expert and lay expectations that Black women artists address their work to slavery and its legacies in order to effect racial healing and empowerment. Um, but the book I'm writing does something different. My book charts a new genealogy of Black women's art that claims space for visual work, which is often sidelined in favor of literature, music, and other forms of Black cultural expression. It centers on what I term undesirable representations. And in each chapter, I profile nausea-inducing, dismembered, perverse Black female bodies that artists like Carol Walker, Wangechi Mutu, who I'll talk about today, Xaviera Simmons, and Narcissister have made in recent sculpture, collage, photography, and performance art. All of these artists were born in the late 1960s and early 1970s when ideas about Blackness and womanhood were radically shifting. And their work in the early 21st century represents another sea change in how we see and analyze Black women's creative labors. Kenyan-born artist Wangechi Mutu's multimedia practice really exemplifies this for me. Um, I first saw her work in 2008 at Suzanne Bellnetter's gallery space in Culver City. Mutu's complex images push at our capacity to reconcile historical experience and trauma with the desire for new and progressive forms of togetherness in the 21st century. One of the most recognized contemporary Black artists working today 
She is best known for her collages that picture grotesque yet dazzling representations of hybrid figures and otherworldly environments populated by black and racially ambiguous sideboard women. And she's been making collages since the year 2000. Using art historical strategies of accumulation to create unique depictions of human and non-human relations, her collages, drawings on paper, sculptures, installations, and video works contest Western conceptions of otherness in terms of race, gender, and sexual identity. Of her work, Mutu says, females carry the marks, language, and nuances of their culture more than the male. Anything that is desired or despised is always placed on the female body. Countering this cultural tendency to devalue the female body, Mutu places female figures at the center of her art as protagonists, as she calls them, while also confounding conventional representations of racial and gender kinship. Her hybrid and multiple figures are often considered models of embodied resistance to instances of racial, gender, and sexual oppression on the one hand, and feelings of fracture and displacement on the other. Here, hybridity and multiplicity are seen as social goods that subvert colonial power by one, turning the gaze of the subjugated back onto the colonizer, and two, by promoting pluralism or an abundance of possible identity formations. For Mutu's critics, her cyborgs are empowering amalgams of black womanhood and mutual belonging self-regenerating cross-species hybrids that affirm our collective racial futures and gender futures for that matter. They engender the transformative potential of commonality and coalition, a way forward. In this formation, the cyborg finds its ideal expression in collage, which art historians generally see as the act and process of bringing disparate parts into union. And I know that many of you in the audience are um, art makers yourselves, so um, you probably make collage, it's one of the um, most accessible art forms that we have. Rather than claiming Mutu cyborg figures as hybrid reassembled bodies that achieve self-determination and mutual belonging, I view the artist's collages as examples of transgressive dismemberment, an expression of what I call undesirability in the title of my book. To transgress means to offend, to violate accepted or imposed boundaries, especially those of socio socialist acceptability. And within collage, you know, there are a number of, of imposed um, boundaries that are um, drawn from the artist's hand or multiple media that's being kind of um, imported um, in the act of making. Pairing transgressive with dismemberment foregrounds the parasite host relations and acts of cutting as imposed violence that constitute Mutu's practice, acts that in turn produce ruptured bodies that break with the basic tenets of figuration and what we expect Black women's visual work to do. Mutu's collages incorporate alternate undesirable forms of transformation and neither wholeness nor repair motivates her unconventional approach to Black female embodiment. Her cyborgs merge longing with loss um, and with refusal and failure to mark a crisis in progressive politics at the turn of the 21st century. A crisis that we are very much still in, right? As we've seen this week. The image species relations that comprise Mutu cyborgs result in dismembered bodies that display a different kind of mutualism, one that explodes racial coexistence and unity as the basis for contemporary sociality as a result, they displace wholeness and togetherness in the present as desirable models of Black representation. At All the World's Futures, the 2015 Biennale exhibition in Venice, Italy, Mutu presented three new works across a range of media, a three-channel animated video, a sculptural installation, and a large-scale collage in a room entirely de dedicated to the artist. Each work represents a scene of creation, an origin myth drawn from either the artist's imagination or well-known cultural texts such as the Bible. All three works feature transmuted female figures that are frightening, mysterious, and productive, albeit in negative and counterintuitive ways. In the three screen video titled The End of Carrying All, a black woman wearing a head wrap and a cotton print dress trudges across a dismal landscape of grasses. 
She balances a basket on her head as the sun in the background casts her body and the landscape in soft silhouette. Flocks of birds migrate low across the sky. As the basket on the figure's head grows bigger, she stumbles under its weight. Objects including a bicycle wheel, a small house, and a satellite dish overflow, multiply, and pile on top of each other, fantastically, seemingly of their own accord. The woman's back bends, her body bowed under her burdens, increasing mask as she slowly approaches the edge of the world. At the end of the 10 minute video, the earth rises up and swallows her. This final act of consumption sends a ripple through the bleak landscape, as if to suggest the possibility of transformation, while at the same time stopping short of animating that transformation. The video fades to black once the earth settles before looping back to its beginning, and the faint sound of birds is the last thing we hear. Here, the form suggests renewal and its return to the beginning, but the content of the video portrays a strange death. Neither the character nor the landscape regenerate after this scene. This video plays on conventional Eurocentric representations of racialized and gendered labor in spaces designated as quote unquote third world, while also providing a strong critique of the exploitative logics of uneven capitalist accumulation and economic development. Thus, the load the female figure in the landscape carries is both the burden of representation and the weight of superfluous material consumption and waste. What gets animated is not positive transformation and renewal, but violent upheaval at the end and the edge of the world. What gets accumulated in the end of carrying all is not wealth, but junk. This strategy of material accumulation comes to bear in a very literal way in She's Got the Whole World in Her, Mutu's sculptural installation for the Venice Biennale. The sculpture features a black mud covered figure, half woman, half mermaid, perched on her stomach and peering into an earthen globe suspended before her. The figure is covered in pulp made from junk mail an expansive geometric, geometric structure resembling a crinoline cage surrounds her hind parts as a collection of curios, miniature gnomes, and fauna trails behind her. The subject of Forbidden Fruit Picker, as you see here, is also a, fig a female figure perched atop a mound situated between a dark foreboding tree and a pair of serpents. The figure's body is composed of photographic fragments of human, animal, and motorcycle parts cut from magazines. Self-assured, she reaches for the lurid, ripe fruit hanging from the tree before her. She does not touch it, however. The sacred and profane come together in these two works. One title referencing a Christian song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. And the other, the other referencing iconography that represents or represents Eve in the garden, Eve, the first mother um, in Am Amharic, is it Al Alhambra? Mm -hmm. Religions. Um, and when I teach this um, collage in my classes, my students are always 
um, drawn to the fact um, that, you know, it's a very like tonally a foreboding or ominous scene. It looks, there's a barren um, landscape. The uh, colors are not realistic. They are distorted. Um, there's instances of blood spatter. The figures, um, leg, lower leg is, um, is amputated or dismembered. Um, and so these are all um, things that I am also drawn to when I'm thinking about um, Mutu's work. The Black women in all three of these works appear as fragmented vessels through landscapes and cone-shaped cages in search of the Earth's edge, new worlds, and knowledge. What they generate, however, is junk, curious waste, and a focus on the ambivalent relationship between aspiration and attainment. The worlds they inhabit are at once marked by disorder, change, and excess, from the amorphous globs of junk and putrefying matter that grow and devour their surroundings to the accumulation of the dense layers of images in the collage. Through persistent dismemberment across media, but especially in collage, Mutu's compositions alter not only the way we think about the artist's output during the first two decades of the 21st century, but also the present and future terms of being and belonging for women of African descent in an increasingly uncertain world. And this is important because this period is when terms like post-racialism, the idea that we have collectively progressed beyond identity categories such as gender and, uh, excuse me, such as race, um, but gender for that matter, begin to emerge. Mutu's work really challenges these ideas, especially at the level of matter and materiality. And you can see how she's manipulating skin in these ways that kind of contest how we assign um, racial categories to skin color. Um, and her own biography also informs her practice. Born in Nairobi, Kenya, and educated in the United Kingdom, she is a self-avowed transnational Black feminist artist whose immigrant status in New York City in the 1990s gave rise to a search for home and belonging visualized through the repeated presence of trees and roots in her work. As a Black woman artist living and working in the US, Mutu concedes, quote, collages, assemblage, and mixing genres are merely tools to facilitate the rewriting of my memories and history, end quote. Histories of colonialism, racialization, and gendered forms of violence and trauma. In an interview with late curator Okwi Enwezor, she further explains how creation stories function as her own form of myth-making. She states, when I say I'm an African artist, I mean it's part of my practice, part of who I am, because I was born and raised there. But often when people say I'm an African artist, it's reductive, it's exotic, it comes from a world that's in the past, these kinds of stereotypes. Even broaching the idea of race is very complicated because Africans have a different historical experience to those who were abducted and brought here to the USA. There are equal senses of alienation and exile, but the myth that's loudest is the slave narrative, which doesn't apply to a huge amount of Africans, myself included. I always say that I was racialized in America my work relates to the forced creation story that the colonialists invented us, Africans, Black people. Mutu's comments about her lived experience, her lived Black experience, synchronize complex debates concerning historical reconstruction as the grounds for Black belonging and progressive racial politics in the 21st century. The distance she draws between her own blackness and her experiences of racialization in the US, as well as differences between African and American blackness, throws into question the idea that the slave past provides a ready prism for apprehending and embodying racial and gender kinship across the black diaspora internally and externally from within and without. While she samples equally from African vernacular forms, historical avant-garde strategies made popular in Europe at the turn of the 20th century and American mass culture. Her work also merges politics and aesthetics in ways that exceed persistent projections of hybridity and multiplicity as social goods. Her amalgamations instead visualize uneasy relations between others, between disparate identities and um, entities that challenge us to rethink claims to slavery as the nexus of shared Black experience in the present, as well as the promise that repair holds for Black women's futures. 
Along these lines, non je ne regret rien, translated to no, I have no regrets, one of the most striking and unsettling collages from Mutu's Yo and I series of 2007, confronts the viewer with a complex scene of dismemberment and dispossession. Yo and I was the artist's first solo exhibition at Victoria Miro Gallery in London. And in the image, you see a maimed figure, part human, part animal, part machine, suspended in the middle of a gray and brown haze. Severed from its upper half and projected into a cumulus abyss, only the lower limbs of the figure remain. Separated like scissors, the bottom leg extends and the top leg bends at the knee, reaching upward in a shape that mimics a scorpion's tail. Instead of a knee joint, the top leg is equipped with a motorcycle wheel that connects to spinal tubing. And instead of a foot, the bottom leg is fitted with an amalgam of animal hoof, stiletto and blooming flower. The stiletto and blooming flower are common signifiers of female sexuality and the figure's splotchy brown painted skin suggests racial blackness while also declining to confirm it. Green and gray scaled tentacles cover its pelvic region. A coiling serpent, its skin imbued with violet, red and other earthen hues inhabits a portion of the left half left half of the figure of the picture plane. Though the serpent flanks the ruptured female body, the creature does not appear to directly interact with it in such a way to distract from or undermine the status of the central figure. It appears in relation to the ruptured female body, a parasite host configuration that frames and directs our view back to the aberration at the center of the image. Mesh that resembles a network of cell fragments and black colored soil spill out of the figure's burst torso. Dark multicolored roots sprout from the figure's lower abdomen and overlap its sprawling tentacles. The roots represent an inversion of plant and floral imagery, countering the art historical tendency to associate flowers with white femininity and fertility. Colliding color fields of ochre, green, and pink spatter the gray background, apparently spewing from the figure's top leg from which its foot appears to have viol been violently amputated. And that's really the central kind of um, scene of conflict in this, um, in this image. And Mutu's use of mylar, um, the support for this, um, for this um, image and the series, Yo and I, more broadly, further emphasizes the conditions of dismemberment and dislocation of bodies, of time and place, and of imported media that constitute her work. Mylar is a synthetic polyester film that causes paint to pool and appear to float on the surface of the material. The material also produces a glistening sheen that draws our focus to the surfaces or the skin of the work um, and the figures therein. Here, the material support for Mutu's collages is both skin and background. Put differently, um, the figure and ground meld into one, each, to one another, an added dimension that calls into question what exactly is being presented. Um, are the collage cyborgs conglomerations of surface, of depth? Um, given the blending of skin and background, where do we locate the figure's subjectivity? Mutu's dismembered black female protagonists and the surfaces on which they are suspended complicate classical notions of matter and its origins, as well as the tactile conditions of racial and gender belonging at the, in the putatively post-racial years of the 21st century. They are radically other, undesirable in their refusal to come together as racially coherent beings and in the distinction they force between reproduction and reparation as the ingredients for human progress and historical transformation. Adding to the boldness of Mutu's art is the socio-cultural critique embedded within it, a critique concerning black women's pathologies, which finds its suitable expression in collage. The medium quite literally refuses the potential for wholeness and coherence from within the process of making itself. As art historian Courtney J. Martin explains, quote, collages as composites are incapable of ever being whole or made whole again. In their new form, they are part of an unsolvable unit. The fracture of edges and angles giving way to fissures unsealed by glue or a cohesive background, end quote. 
Indeed, as Martin suggests, even in the process of its making, collage is undone. And Nolan Jene Regret Rien exaggerates this language of fragmentation and undoing, thereby reconstituting what it means to be Black woman and human at the level of the body in the 21st century. Instead of affirming bodily agency and mutual support, the visually arresting collage explodes the Black female body as a locus upon and within which racial, gender, and sexual codes materialize in the past and present as future. The birth scenes, alien mothers, cyborgs, and dismembered offspring that recur throughout Mutu's work animate the limits of bodily trauma and collective memory during an era, era of techno-optimism and post-identity desire. The recurrence of ruptured bodies in particular turns away from kinship and communal relations as loci for racial and gender belonging. Notably, the majority of her art depicts the black female body as the ground from which non-normative conceptions of reproduction, futurity, and humanness spring. From the refashioning of Eve as a cyborg woman and mother in the Forbidden Fruit Picker collage that I showed earlier, um, to the alien mother that you see here on the left and the prodigal daughter that you see here on the right from a later series called Family Tree, the act of creation for Mutu is an act of alienation. So that's a little bit about my current research, which I'll be completing at the Getty Research Institute next year as a postdoctoral um, fellow, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So I'll actually be in LA with all of you then. And this work um, has spurred other great opportunities. Um, I've had the honor of interviewing Mutu. Um, I've worked with her and Edgar Arsenault on a, a dual site-specific drawing and painting installation at Site Santa Fe in New Mexico. I've moderated a panel on her work within the context of Afrofuturism at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, of, um, a, a picture of which you see at the top of your screen. And I also recently curated a virtual exhibition on Google Arts and Culture called Curating the End of the World, where the art, which spans collage, sound and video art, and other mediums, addresses many of the concerns about the limits um, and possibilities of destruction and the creative act that really emerge in um, Mutu's practice and that she's also constantly confronting um, on her own. Um, she's, she talks a lot about the kind of tension between um, disgust or decay and regeneration, this kind of um, tension and um, potential balance that she's trying to strike with her work. So that's a lot. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, the first is, can you explain Mutu in relation to Afrofuturism and the Black arts movement? And do such historical labels limit the fullness of the work? Should I stop sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, that, that'd be perfect. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like, otherwise you'll just stare at a black slide. <laughs> um, thank you for that question. Uh, so Mutu, because of the cyborg, inner, uh, the cyborg imagery that populates so much of Mutu's work, she's often um, talked about in terms of Afrofuturism which Afrofuturism is a term that was coined in the mid to uh, early to mid 1990s by a cultural critic um, named Mark Derry, who was writing um, at the time was writing for um, pu uh, publications like the Village Voice in New York um, and really interrogating the kind of um, anticipation of the tech, the tech bubble boom tech boom and bubble, tech bubble and boom, I don't know. Um, but really this kind of uh, fetishization of technology that was happening in the, in the 1990s that we are now fully immersed in that we don't even, I mean, some of us don't, don't even realize how, how uh, uh, a part of our person it is now um, and within our culture. Um, so he was really um, questioning that and also started to question why um, so many uh, authors of African descent um, weren't better represented within genres that uh, are future oriented, such as literary genres, such as science fiction and speculative fiction. Um, now there's a whole subsection of uh, science fiction that's called black sci science fiction, but this, um, the term Afro 
coining the term Afrofuturism in the 1990s really kind of sparked um, a 25 year um, expansion of the term that we're now, now in a, a kind of second, even third wave of thinking about it um, that starts to inter like one um, kind of complicate the origins of the term in the 1990s and to really kind of zoom out and see that there's one, a longer history of black speculative um, writing and um, artistic production more broadly um, and to, to kind of recenter it within um, an Afro African diaspora context. And so Mutu being an African born artist who spent 25 years of her career um, um, living and working in the U in, in New York City and now is between um, Nairobi and New York, um, really uh, in terms of the cyborg imagery that she puts in her work um, and her own kind of thinking about um, her situatedness, um, moving between these different conceptions, these kinds of different cultural and national conceptions of blackness um, are, are why she gets kind of associated with Afrofuturism. Um, and within Afrofuturism and even other discourses that are kind of fascinated with the future of humanity, um, the cyborg figure really gets marketed as this kind of ideal figure that's gonna equip us with the tools that we need to kind of navigate these uncertain futures because they're hybrid, um, they are part human and part machine and potentially other species. Um, and they really become a metaphor for kind of cross-racial um, coalition or collaboration. Um, and so, okay, Afrofuturism and black arts movement, okay. Um, Black arts movement, so Afrofuturism, I guess you could um, within the longer uh, tradition of black aesthetic thought could see it as an outgrowth of the black arts movement in terms of self-determination and these other kinds of tenets of national, black nationalism. Um, and I think particularly within, in, in terms of my own work, the way that Afrofuturism is, is, is now being conceived um, within black studies um, and kind of bringing Afrofuturism back to a kind of um, um, Black radical tradition, I guess you could say. So I guess, I mean, in that way, you could make a case that there's a relationship between the Black arts movement and Afrofuturism. Um, in terms of limit those, those, like periodization as a limit, absolutely. Um, and I think that part of what my answer gets at is that there's a little bit of fluidity, you know, there's not like a hard stop with the black arts movement. There's not a hard start with Afrofuturism, right? Um, and so a lot of the work that's being done now um, and that even Mutu calls us to do in terms of how she narrates her own experiences with, um, uh, with living in black skin, living as a black woman, um, being racialized in the US is to really think about the kind of origin myths that we attach to uh, like the origin myths that we tell about ourselves, right? Um, and the black, I mean, the, tr the long tradition of black aesthetic thought, it definitely plays into that. I hope that answers the question. I think I got all parts of that. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, you did, definitely. Um, the next question is how has dance influenced your practice? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So um, looking, uh, I don't know how many of you are dancers <laughs> in the audience, in the virtual audience, but um, dance was really my first, um, what do you call it? What would I call it? My first, my, my initiation or orientation to critical analysis um, and even visual analysis, like have, be, having the responsibility of looking at a piece of, at, a, at movement, from an ex, a quote unquote expert body, right? Like either the instructor or another choreographer um, um, dictating um, movement to you and having to translate that onto your own body. There's a process of um, like a cognitive process that happens, right? Where you looking and then you digest the information and then you kind of translate it and then you recreate it with your own body trying to mimic um, what's happening. So you learn a lot about, you know these kinds of art historical tenants like my, uh, or not tenants, but like, um, practices and traditions like mim um, mimesis and, you know, the difference between a copy and an original, um, um, the idealization of the body of a certain body type within um, visual art. Um, and so I really think of dance as a visual medium 
um, and I've written on this before um, in an essay on Bill T. Jones, who's a very famous kind of postmodern um, contact improvisation black choreographer or choreographer of African descent, um, choreographer and dancer. And so dance still very much heavily informs the way that I look at objects, the way that I think about analysis and how I perform analysis um, and how I encourage my students to, to really spend time with objects and thinking about um, just what the object is saying, what it's doing, what it's demanding of us as viewers. Um, and I also still practice. Like I dance every week, whether that's taking class, um, I'm still in conversation with dancers. I've worked as a dance editor, which means I've worked with choreographers to kind of rehearse um, and to mold certain kind of um, phrases. I still write on dance. Um, so yeah, I think that answers the question. <laughs> I also took um, ballet classes when I was an employee at LMU. I would take my, I would, on my lunch break, I would go <laughs> and take um, classes in the dance department. So very much with me all the time. <laughs> all right, let's see. Our next question is, um, do you think that collage and related forms such as montage, sampling, appropriation, et cetera, are particularly appealing for black artists interested in questions of representation for additional reasons to the ones you mentioned in your analysis of Mutu's work? Um, thank you for that. I think that, Mm. It, if I can rephrase the question a little bit, or maybe I'll, the, my answer will help rephrase the question. Um, so it's, it's not so much that, mm, I'm sure that there is an appeal um, and I don't, I don't wanna dictate um, or um, make black artists uh, desires monolithic. Um, but I do, I, what I can say in terms of art historical writing on collage within um, aesthetic practices of um, artists of African descent is that collage uh, is, has, has, has become kind of synonymous with marginalized subjects who are, um, who have historically experienced marginalization, oppression, otherness, um, othering. I guess, and so that's that's not um, uh, exclusive to artists of African descent. That's women artists too. Feminist collage is a very kind of robust um, subfield of, of of writing art historical writing on collage. Um, so, so yes and no <laughs> um, to that question. Yes, um, I think that we have come to understand. Um, collage as a particularly desirable art form for um, minoritized or marginalized artists. Um, but do I think that it's inherent or essential to them? Not necessarily. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, is there any exciting LA or Southern California based artists that we should check out perhaps because they are an up and, up and coming or lesser known? Oh, <clears throat> that is a really great question. Some folks that I have been looking at since my, I mean, since the bulk of my research right now is centered on um, women artists of the Black diaspora. Um, there is an artist who has a show up at Ochi Projects right now, Yasmin Diaz, I believe. Um, and the work looks amazing. Um, they had an, uh, a virtual exhibition of another artist earlier this year, Hannah, I cannot remember her last name, but she, um, she draws and I just very, um, very cool kind of graphically inclined um, drawing work. Um, Lauren Halsey is another artist who I think David Kordansky, I think is represented by David Kordansky. Um, but born and raised South LA um, and just doing really great expand, like expanded field like sculpture and in, 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 um, in, in, in very funky, um, immersive um, ways that are pushing the boundaries of installation art. So those would be like my three. I'll try to get um, Hannah's name. Um, actually. All right, um, it's, here's the next question. 
it seems to me that one of several limitations of the Afrofuturist idea, and to some extent the manifestos of the Black Arts Movement, is its specific Americanness. Mutu's work appears to push against or propose escapes from that particular centrism. <clears throat> Um, Hannah Ward is the is the the artist that I was thinking of. Um, so Lauren Halsey, Hannah Ward, and uh, Yasmin Diaz. Um, the limits to Afrofuturism. Was there another? Was was there a second part to that question, or did I? I hope I didn't cut you. Got it. It was um, the, the the sort of talking about the specific Americanness, and that mm -hmm. whose work appears to push against or propose escapes from that particular centrism. Okay. So there's so many ways to answer this question. So I'll try to get to all, at least a little, a little preview of each way to answer the question. So one is that um, part of the second slash into the third way, the emerging third wave of Afrofuturist scholarship, um, scholarship practice, um, scholarship, I'm thinking broadly, um, is that it critiques that specific kind of US centrism of the of the of the kind of original quote unquote original fashioning of the term. But again, thinking, you know, this is a white male author, thinking about an absence in black in in, sci in the science fiction genre, um, literature and film. So that's part of where that um, you know it's it's good to be historically specific about the emergence of, of these terms and trends, right? Um, and so but that um, part, another part, another gap or um, absence that that also um, initiates is one that ignores the kind of speculative imagination and production um, continentally in terms of African artists, African-born artists. Um, there is a long, you know, a long tradition of long tradition of even African based surrealisms, um, right? And so there's there's work that's being done now that's about, that's thinking about new black surrealisms and um, I'm, that's part of another part of my work and um, our kind of tangent or spur from the work that I've done on Afrofuturism, but it's really, that is, it's about interrogating and kind of thinking about, thinking more broadly about a black diasporic imagination while also not making blackness this kind of monolithic thing that happens in each of these very different geographic and cultural contexts, um, if that makes sense. So the manifestos, I'm, you know, one of my favorite Afro, if you can call it that Afrofuturist manifesto is um, Martine Sims, um, the mundane Afrofuturist manifesto actually, that is part of this kind of critique, internal critique of how we think about Afrofuturism. And part of that critique is also about this desire for escape, like what does that say about, like what does that desire um, or the desire to see escape in a work? What does that say about um, the limits and possibilities of, of representation and our, our, creative, our creative acts, right? Um, and so when I write about or think about Afrofuturism, um, part of how I even got into this work um, to be thinking about Mutu as a kind of a uh, transgressive figure even within Afrofuturism is precisely that, the kinds of, um, the kinds of negative possibilities or the kinds of failures that, it, that we're confronted with in her work on the level of form um, and in terms of bodily integrity that, or, that compel us that abs or demand that we, re that we even rethink what we expect Afrofuturism to do um, along the lines of escape or repair or redemption or um, even the promise of a particular type of future. Does that, if that makes sense? I hope I answered um, all of that question, but um, yeah. So I just wanna, I just wanna say, amplify that there are, there's a, a whole other set of um, discourse and conversations that are happening about Afrofuturism that are very Afrocentric. Um, part of that is, be, is happening within Black Studies departments in the U.S., but most of that is being driven by continental African folks who are doing the work, who are practitioners, who are scholars, who are artists, um, curators. So yeah, that it's out there. Wonderful. We have one last question. How would you approach people or family members who have generalized the message of Black Lives Matter 
the frequently pressed question of police or systemic marginalized racism against the Black and African American communities. How might you explain their ambiguities in a way that helps them understand the big picture? I think that the way I approach that in my, not I think, let me say, the way that I approach that in my own conversations with my peers and family members um, is to call attention to the fact that difference uh, is, is present in every kind of group um, and in every, every community so that, you know, we, whiteness isn't monolithic um, and whiteness and white supremacy or whiteness and anti-blackness are not the same, right? That there's, there's just, like there's the level of the system and then there's the level of the episodic or the individual, the kind of social, social sphere and how we relate to one another. Um, and so being in the world with others, which is what Mutu's work is really about, um, being in the world with others, whether those are human others or whether those are machine others or um, even uh, you know, plant life, um, bio different forms of biological life um, and inanimate life. Like we, the, our charge is to learn how to exist, um, not necessarily to discipline, to discipline difference, but to, co to exist um, within it. And I think going back to the question about Black, um, not Black Lives Matter, but Black Arts Movement as in the Black Power Movement as a kind of precursor to even Black Lives Matter um, is, is precisely, um, is, is where that um, contest, I mean, where we can start to get at some of that, that tension and really tease that out. Um, it's for Black Power, um, Black Power and Black Arts Movement proponents, you know, a nationalist or a separate Black state was, um, for, for some, was desirable um, and ideal, right? But um, how realistic is that when, you know, we are confronting difference and otherness within ourselves every day? So I don't know if that's instructive. Um, I think it's, it's really hard to, um, to kind of give a sweeping prescription for how to deal with these things, but um, there are multiple resources available, you know, there's reading lists and um, all kinds of resources um, that the Movement for Black Lives has collated on their website um, and elsewhere, but I think at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, um, it's really about underscoring that difference is all around us and there's not, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing, right, like difference is what makes us, difference is what makes us thrive. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm going to ask Karen to pop in. I have popped. <laughs> Thank you so um, much for those questions. So I hope I answered everything. It was, it was wonderful. And um, so I want to kind of, I want to ask a few questions of my own, but I also want to kind of reflect on some of the things that you said. The first is that all of the work that you showed and shared of Mutu is brilliant on this monitor, but in person it is even more sublime. And I have had the privilege of seeing one of her major shows in New York. I don't remember when at the Brooklyn Museum. And um, it, it, it is completely unforgettable. And it must be a joy for you to have her work and the other artists that you mentioned um, as part of your, um, your research and to students out there, I can't think honestly of a better scenario than to get to do you know, something with so much passion that you have, Dr. Barber, and um, to, to work with these artists. Um, so I know that next year you will be here at the Getty in Los Angeles. Um, writing your um, manuscript to publish your, um, your, your book. Um, I want to ask you just if you could tell us again the title of your dissertation and how you um, formulated um, this approach to, um, to, to the artists that you mentioned that you're working on. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so let's see, let's see. The title of my dissertation was um, Undesirability and the Value of Blackness in Contemporary Art. Um, my advisor was, uh, 
very um, resistant to colons. He hated taglines. So he was very like um, encouraging of his students to try to come up with one liners as titles. So that was my attempt. Um, but I brought it back for the book, which is titled is now titled Undesirability and Her Sisters, um, Black Women's Visual Work. So the, the translation from the dissertation to now, or the yeah, the translation or transition that's happened is that the, the dissertation focused on all four of these artists as well, but it did not center the question of gender. I mean, the glaring, the, the kind of glaring obvious thing um, in my dissertation defense was like, but you're writing on all women artists and you don't say anything about womanhood or gender, or you don't say enough. So that was a prompt for me to to kind of restructure the book along those lines. Um, I also, um, while I was doing my research fellowship, my pre-doctoral research fellowship at the University of Virginia, um, the director of the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African-American and African Studies, um, Dr. Deborah McDowell, uh, was pivotal in um, shaping the manuscript at that time. And she, um, in her feedback in one of the, so the, the model at, the, at that research institute is a, is a workshop model. So we all, there's a cohort of us, around 10 of us, depending on what year it is, but usually around 10 um, of scholars across um, different fields and, speci and specialties that are all interested in um, the, um, how we can better study and better amplify um, back Black life. Um, and so we all come together um, around questions that are central to the Africa Africana studies discipline. Um, but from a literary standpoint or from an art historical standpoint or from a sociological standpoint, so in, my, in one of the workshops of the chapter from my dissertation to book, um, she, you know, she was just talking out loud. I was like, you know, whatever these kinds of sis the sisters of the forms that you're, that you're talking about or the aesthetic choices. And I was like, sisters, oh my God, yes. And so that got me thinking about kinship and sisterhood mm -hmm. and, and how, again, this kind of, um, how within the wake of kind of, um, ideas about being beyond race or being beyond gender, whether that's a post-Black notion or a post-race notion or an intersectional notion. So all of these kinds of discourses within identity-based um, identity based art practice, as well as critical theory, um, the way that intersectionality has become like a very mainstream theme. I mean, Kimberly Crenshaw is having live IG talks with Janelle Monet. Like I like I can like it's it's amazing to me that this is such a prominent part of our of our everyday language now. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of that thinking about sisters and being sisterly, right? And like um, and how, what that how that manifests in aesthetic practice for black women what are the limits of poss and possibilities of thinking about kinship and sisterhood um, intra-racially um, among artists, women artists who identify as um, African, from African descent. So that's how the transition from dissertation to book really, hmm. really went. <laughs> it was just in conversation with people and being like, oh my God, yeah, that's a buzzword that I haven't explored. I should do that, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that you shared it because it really sticks now in my mind. Um, my last question is just to ask you a little bit about the landscape of the Department of Art History, where you are at the University of Delaware. Is your position a new position because you are in two departments? And um, tell me, since you've been there, what, what things that have happened that have you feel um, they, they portend good news for the field of art history? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I, I know I keep saying, that's a great question, that's a great question, but this is really something that is, um, that has really been central to my work and my kind of development as a scholar between these two fields or between these two disciplines. Um, one thing that I think a lot about is interdisciplinarity. So what my art history degree, my PhD is, an, is a non-traditional art history program. It's, it's a vis, the, the program is called Visual and Cultural Studies and it's housed in the Department of Art, art and Art History in Rochester, it's very historic. Um, the late Douglas Crimp was one of the cornerstones. He was also my advisor. Um, and so these kinds of, um, 
kind of fights or policing of boundaries didn't exist in that program. Um, but we were well aware of all of the kinds of contestations around keeping knowledge insular, whether that was in art history or visual studies, people kind of being like, oh, we're not art historians and art historians being like, well, we're not visual studies. We actually have like a method here. And, you know, the, all these quibbles. Um, and I really, um, the kind of overwhelming whiteness of the, of the faculty of that department really forced me to, in a good way, um, for, my, for my own um, benefit, go outside of the department to find uh, um, an advisor or to build an advisory team for when I was making, writing my dissertation, because I really wanted to show um, that art history has a lot to gain from Africana studies and vice versa. I, I noticed that in Africana studies departments where I was researching, you know, potential jobs or even just where to study, that there weren't a lot of visual thinkers represented in the faculty. On the other side, in art history, there aren't, there weren't at the time, this is almost 10 years ago, there weren't um, a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of representation of um, African American or African diasporic um, specialists. Um, and sadly, that still remains pretty true on both sides. Um, there is a, sh there's definitely a shift. Um, and I think that it's becoming more common that the languages and vocabularies, the shared vocabularies between the two disciplines is becoming elevated um, because of people like me and, and pe folks who have come before me who have really pushed the academy to think, to make room for that. Um, so that's something that I did at Delaware when I got, I, my, my primary appointment is in Africana studies. Um, and luckily the department, um, is a highly ranked department and incredibly visionary in terms of seeing the value of visual and material culture study. Um, I think that's partially because Delaware already has a language for understanding that. They have a center for material culture studies that is a very um, kind of well known, but it's again mired in its own kind of blind spots around 19th century, early 20th century Americanism, um, and so as only only now starting to to think about how it's how itself can decolonize its own um, pedagogical approaches to material culture studies, um, particularly in the Winterthur Museum, but also right. at the University of Delaware. Um, and likewise, the University of Delaware, the art, the art history department, um, they um, also have had historically kind of one Africanist, Africanist, which is a very limiting and narrow um, uh, label or category because Ikem does so much more than that. But I mean, he's kind of been the kind of staple, dare I say token. Um, and so what, part of when I, got the job and was negotiating, I was very adamant about wanting to maintain a, an affiliation with my home discipline, which is art history for all intents and purposes. Um, and so, and that was only the Africana Studies Department saw that as a strength, right? So as part of one of our four pillars um, within our curricular focus, visual and material culture studies is very prominent within our course offerings. It's very prominent in our pedagogy. It's very prominent in how we conceive and um, of conceive of the kind of best way to study and grapple with the contradictions of black life in the, in the US and the Caribbean, Europe and Africa and elsewhere. Um, so I just got, I got really lucky in terms of my, my placement in Africana studies and that the Department of Art History was also very excited about me coming. Um, and I, I think that's a testament to a lot of the new hires in art history who uh, are more contemporary and are also um, kind of challenging the department to reconceive of its um, of its own curricular focus, the Department mm -hmm. of Art History. Um, and so the Department of Art History has now started to kind of look outside of itself to think about, you know, who can we collaborate with? Um, um, I think that the Department of Art History is interested in building a major or at least a concentration in a kind of Africana line mm. of art history. So that will be something that the departments get to collaborate on in the future. Um, in terms of graduate level study, we, the Africana Studies Department just launched an MA degree that again, is like very um, neatly situated within our four pillars, Pan-Africanism, gender, um, Blackness, gender, sexuality studies, visual material culture. Um, and, oh gosh, what's this? 
a law, public policy, and social justice. You've got that down. Yeah, I'm like, oh my God, I, we just like launched. And so I've been like updating the website and we've been getting the language together. But that's something that we're really excited about. So that that has like future possibilities, I think, because as we grow and hopefully we'll develop maybe a PhD program. If not, we also have the African-American Public Humanities Initiative, which is again, another kind of visionary um, project that the University of Delaware um, garnered support from, I think it was a Mellon pilot grant that has since kind of um, evolved, but it's still kind of in this precarious state um, within the university where it doesn't have, especially now with budget cuts and COVID, it, um, you know, we're, we're constantly fighting to keep that, keep that with us because we have just amazing scholars who are really doing groundbreaking work, who we get to recruit through that program. Mm -hmm who get to affiliate with art history or history or English. So again, a kind of very robust interdisciplinary model that Africana studies is at the core of. So um, that is incredibly inspiring. Yeah, to hear what, exciting. what's happening. And I can't think of a better person to be there to kind of be a leader. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Barber. Um, COVID has limited our world so much, but in this way, having you come to LMU has broadened it. Um, you are a delight. Um, and I look forward to seeing you post COVID at the Getty to talk about what you're, you're doing um, with your research there. So thank you so much, TGIF. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the questions and for hosting me. I really appreciate this. This is a real, a real pleasure. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, team. <laughs>